here um, in Kiev. Uh, so, so this is a tutorial, and I know I'm between you and lunch, but I'm glad to hear that I'm not between you and lunch. This is uh, it's going to be before I or after that, so uh, it'll be so bad. Um, so today is uh, a bit of a tutorial, a general overview of what has happened in uh, spintronics over the last decade. So it's a little bit of a tall order to do so. Uh, and this, we probably, probably may not get to all of the things that we're going to talk about. Uh, some of these things is very recent that I'm going to talk about tomorrow. So, so the order of here, it doesn't really have to, around in one hour I'll stop and we'll continue with that. And also I'd like to tell you later on about Spice, but in the, in the spirit of uh, general elections and self-promotion by, by Donald Trump, I'm going to start with that instead. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about what Spice is about, this new center that we have, and because uh, in this, you know, we have also quite a few tutorials and resources for the students uh, to look at. Uh, this is also a, a partially sponsored in this, uh, this workshop. Uh, so this has been phenomenal interdisciplinary center started uh, with me moving to, uh, uh, to Mainz, Germany, which is next to Frankfurt, so it's quite uh, used to, easy to get there. Uh, and it's a, it's a center, uh, not totally dedicated to spin phenomena, but more to an interdisciplinary, where you merge uh, two different areas and you try to bring workshops where essentially you don't know quite well the other half of the people in the audience. Uh, and then uh, there are a lot of interactions within these workshops. Uh, and particularly also we have almost all the talks uh, taped and put on a YouTube channel. So you can go to the YouTube channel and subscribe to it. Uh, and there you can see there's a lot of the talks from the different workshops that we've had. And particularly we mixed a lot of the talks uh, and the workshops as a format where you have to have a tutorial before the other uh, area, for, for the other area that is interacting with. It's a little bit of just in kind of teaching type of effect. Uh, and some of the students, is, they're very popular and I think it's useful to, uh, to see them. Uh, the recent one, for example, the last one, a week ago, is an antiferromagnetic spintronics that we'll talk about at the end of this talk. Uh, and we will be posting the talks very soon. Uh, we also have uh, visitors programs. You know, so you, this once in a while there's people that come to visit us, you know, you may be familiar with this guy, but sometimes there's a little bit of interactions with the visitors that we find that interesting. Uh, but but uh, you know, after that, there's no problem because we have plenty of wine and good things to do in mines. Uh, so, so you can have a good time if you visit the workshops, okay? So, we have this better weather than it is here at the moment. Now, let's go back to the physics then. Now that I this a little bit of spice. And uh, what I'm going to talk about is about how to, uh, new ways that we found how to manipulate and uh, exploit magnetization and magnetodynamics. It is one of the areas of uh, basic research and physics that is most linked or quite linked to actual possible applications in the distant future. We're never going to deliver a device for you, of course, and we're really much more interested in the physics. But one that's, that is really connected to it, uh, and this is uh, a phenomena where we're going to, you know, there's already quite a decade, more than a decade old ideas of how to manipulate magnetizations with spin transfer torque, and then to, uh, how we have actually utilized the now decade old, a little more than a decade old idea of the spin hole effect and the inverse spin galvanic effect uh, to exploit and create these new spin orbit torques uh, that are now being the ones exploited as a very, very much future idea for the magnetic random access memory. Then another thing uh, that we've uh, done the next step is to actually forget about magnetism and uh, uh, talk about antiferromagnetism, where you end up with the manipulation uh, of antiferromagnets. This is something that here is very familiar to all because this is actually, I would say, the, 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 the capital of antiferromagnets. That all the studies, or the major studies that we're based ourselves upon, uh, are done here in Ukraine. Um, and uh, how we have actually utilized these ideas to create what is nail spin orbit torques that allow you to manipulate the nail or parameter directly by electric current uh, and experiments that have shown to do that. And then the last one is how you can actually merge these ideas of a different magnetic spintronics and direct the physics, direct fermions, uh, and be able to tune the gaps in and out by these torques. So this is a little bit of what we're going. So at the beginning of it all, you need to, you know that when you talk about magnetization dynamics, uh, you talk about the Landau-Lewis-Gilbert equation, 
This is an equation that governs the, the coherent dynamics of the magnetization. We have uh, the magnetization to the time dependence of the magnetization is given to you by a precession around an effective field. This effective field comes from an external field, and internal components that come in isotropy, etc. Uh, and then uh, you have a damping term, so this term is the Gilbert damping term that allows you to relax in the direction of the effective magnetic field. And the physics of the spin transfer torque, uh, first proposed by Sonczewski and Berger, comes from this type of term that you can see in a trialer system, where by injecting uh, this polarized, uh, polarized uh, electrons by uh, writing a current to a ferromagnet, then it goes through a spacer, a normal metal spacer, and then it hinges on a uh, another ferromagnet which is not aligned with, and this ferromagnet absorbs that part of the angular momentum from this carriage that is not lined up with the magnetization, and it allows it to give it a torque. Okay? These are the very basic ideas, you know, essentially that it just comes from conservation of angular momentum. Uh, why is this case, the, what is what you saw in this particular case of the physics of, uh, of the spin transfer torque is coming from the, the ex uh, uh, as the exchange interaction between the local carriers and the local moments. Um, the, the, the carriers themselves and the local moments. Uh, typically, this SD interaction, of course, uh, conserves angular momentum, so in reality, you would think that nothing can change, because the, the change in this one will be to the change on that. But because the time scales are very different on the relaxation, so between the magnetization and the electrons, uh, things can actually happen, and you can have a torque on the uh, and the magnetization. What this means is that uh, when you have these carriers, uh, uh, you produce some sort of non equilibrium magnetization of the carriers, this little m in here, you can produce a torque of one m as long as this m and little m are not lined up. Now, the torque itself, you can decompose it, the torque due to the m, uh, to, the, to this little m, sorry, to the non equilibrium polariza uh, uh, polarization or uh, accumulation that you induce. That is the thing that it can be decomposed in two directions. The lambda you know, Gibbs equation is, is, the, is the equation of the direction of the magnetization. So it's only two directions in this uh, sphere. And uh, one of them will be uh, in the direction of the effective magnetic field, and then the other one perpendicular to that, the second one. And this is where here it's interesting to, to remind ourselves of the, of the nomenclature, of the jargon that is utilized to say the same thing or the same name but used in different names, and sometimes that confuses at least the beginner and the student. So some of them, for example, the energy conserving term, which is M cross M, M uh, this is called sometimes the out of plane, perpendicular torque, effective field, or field like torque. Uh, primarily, this out of plane or perpendicular, or in plane and the parallel, these are due to the, how the sample looks like, particular ideas of the example, the sample that for the experimental setup. But I think it's most used, the field like torque uh, is the most common one, just to remind ourselves that this essentially is an energy conserving term. Whereas the other one, in here, is sometimes called the damping, the dissipative, the Sosevsky torque, spin transfer torque. In reality, it's just the one that is of the Gilbert damping type that allows you to relax or allows you to pump energy in the system because here, uh, this A, in this case, can change the sign depending on your current direction, it's positive or negative. Okay. Now, the physics of this spin transfer torque is independent of spinoid coupling, in a sense. It's quantum mechanically and dependent primarily on the interface. The way it occurs because if you have a polarized current coming in, upon reflection, if you average over the whole Fermi surface, the reflection and the different phases and the shifts that you actually occur... Okay, go ahead. Question about notation. What was little m? Little uh, m is essentially you, you're in the, the spins of the carriers, uh -huh. and capital M is the local moments of the fermagnet. magnet. Okay. So here you have two subsystems, you know, so we're not talking, sometimes you don't have that breakup, but in subsystems you can essentially distinguish between the, local, the, the carriers and the, uh, and the local moments, the, the electrons versus the, the conduction electrons. Yeah? So the setup is I have two magnetic materials, I'm just passing a current through them, right? Right. Now, if this is generating a torque, yeah. how is angular momentum conserved? Where's the torque coming from? So essentially, let me show you. So essentially, here you have this one is usually pinned. So you have a big ferromagnet pinned by something else, by an antiferromagnet behind you. And you have this one pinned. So this one itself is only providing to you um, a, this, this polarized carriers. Mm -hmm. When they come in here, these guys and this, this guy, this guy is going to be absorbed by this one, right? So this, this guy is pointing in this direction. Yep. Okay. 
And then this guy is a little bit misaligned. You see this misalignment, this part? Yeah. So this is the part that is going to be absorbed by the magnetization. So the amount of angular momentum that is perpendicular to the, to the magnetization will be absorbed by the, other, uh, by the, by the ferromagnet mm -hmm. in the opposite side that is, that is having this uh, current pitch up on it. Okay. So it's just adding the, mag the angular momentum, is, is passing this angular momentum of this guy. This angular momentum effectively is lost to the lattice mm -hmm. and then is absorbed by magnetization. Mm -hmm. Globally, you have to conserve angular momentum. What is happening is this carries a loosened angular momentum in average zero to the lattice, therefore the magnetization takes it off. Okay, it's not as simple as that because it depends on time scales. It's a small fraction that is just gone away, so it's not total, but you know, in the usual picture, uh, I think it is a pretty good, pretty, pretty good picture. Yeah. So, so just make sure, so capital M is magnetization of carriers only or no, 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 of, of, the local moments, of the local moments of the, of the, ferro, of the ferromagnet in this side. Yeah, so little m is carriers and capital M is fer ferromagnetic. Yeah, fer ferromagnetic uh, local moments. It's but the magnetization. Is, is a which here we actually is treating it uh, like a classical variable. Are carriers included in capital M? Say again? Are, are carrier magnetic moments included in capital M? No, not in this model. Okay. You can actually include them later on in an initial calculation, try to piece them apart, but not in this model. It's just easier to proceed <coughs> to decouple the two. Okay. And then what I mean by this is that you have the carries coming in, and why, you know, how come you're thinking, well, how, wh where's the loss of this angular momentum? Because sometimes the loss of angular momentum can be to the lattice, or it can be also due to quantum mechanical defacing. Uh, this is essentially the key part of why you don't really need a spin orbit coupling. Uh, at these uh, interfaces, you have a reflection, then you have a random delta phi depending on the, that average essentially to zero if you average over the Fermi surface. And the once it's absorbed in the other side, you would think, well, it, it keeps on oscillating, but there's a difference in, uh, in momentum between the, the majority and minority carries, and this creates um, essentially quantum mechanical defacing of the order of the Fermi wavelength deep into the ferromagnet, and then that is absorbed. In terms of uh, this, there was a development of, of a circuit theory type uh, by Bratta, Swaver, and also Yaroslav and Tsiolkovniak. Uh, and, uh, and this is the origin of this idea of the spin mixing conductance. This is a study in the, the, the idea of this is carrying at this interface, where you have a, an interface mixing conductance that gives you this real and imaginary part of the flips at the interface. And the ratio of these two is essentially a ratio between the field light and damping components. So the real part being the, the anti-damping component and the imaginary part uh, being the, uh, uh, the field light component. And this is how you would compute it just from this scattering theory of electrons on an interface. Um, so this is so far, yeah, this is what I wanted to say. So now, of course, this is just what the physics was you know, about a little more than a decade ago, or five, ten, eight years ago. And it's fairly well understood. It's some physics that I think well understood now and well proven. Uh, but of course, once you end up with the, with the, uh, with inter now with the interfaces where you have a strong spin orbit coupling, this idea gets lost a little bit because you also have losses of a spin at the interface. It is not as simple, and then you have to worry a little bit about uh, some of the things that can happen. So essentially, instead of having this this um, uh, this changes in the spin current, uh, there can be generations of. You have to generalize it. I'm not going to go into any details. This is the next work that was done by Vivek Amin um, and Mark Stiles uh, to try to generalize this, uh, this uh, circuit theory to incorporate this kind of a couple and an interface. And in this case, they notice that you can also have some generation of spin currents due to this scattering process. So the idea of, of this mixing conductance has to be a little bit revised. But the physics of it, uh, just, just to, to emphasize this here, it still remains quite valid in terms of this transfer of angular momentum. It has been transferred to it. And one of the things that I want to emphasize is that it's a transfer of angular momentum in real space, in a sense. You're essentially taking the, 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 the spin currents generated from some place. Here you're actually polarizing from a ferromagnet, and grabbing it and taking it, and it's absorbing this part of the space. Okay? This is something that is happening effectively by motion of these uh, currents. And this is the thing that now it is relevant in terms of, uh, and it's very strongly being pushed, and I think there's some commercial available now, and to create these magnetic random access memories. There were some prior random access memories which had to do with taggles 
of magnetic field where you are sensitive to magnetic current and you switch things around, you try to create these magnetic memories where there's no mechanical motion, there's no hard drive, just currents. And you can create them by doing this uh, switching uh, where essentially you have your pin ferromagnet and this is the one that is not pinned and you run the current through this metal, uh, metal uh, magnetic panel junction and you flip them around. This type of structure scales pretty well, uh, it has lower power, there's no crosstalk problems of this magnetic field switching another part of the, of the device or another bit. Uh, but there is a little bit of a problem because here you need quite a lot of currents to flip. Here you have a quasi particles, it's a flux of quasi particles flipping a macroscopic order parameter. So you need an eno enough amount in order for it to topple, to overcome uh, the spinning, the typical pinning on the dump pin from the Gilbert dump pin. And that means that many times you're going to have the breakdown voltage and the voltage to right, which is the main source of heating or the larger current that you need, uh, overlapping with each other and melting down. So instead of having a crash like you have in hard drive, you have meltdowns of your, of your memories. And this is where the physics have turned to think about uh, geometries where you, you know, could you actually switch the ferro the, this ferromagnet, which is where you, you want to store your bit, by running currents through this metal, uh, in this case a heavy metal, right on the top of it. And then being able to just utilize this one to read, for example. Okay? This is one of the, of the things where, where essentially the story has turned and utilized, and where we have gone to a spin hole effect, an inverse spin hole effect as, as a tool. Uh, and his, and his uh, companion uh, partner, which is the inverse spin harmonic effect. So let me go on next to say a little bit about the spin hole effect. Uh, this, of course, uh, is an effect that was initially proposed uh, in 1971, one year before I was born, in, um, uh, by, by Lyakhanov, but kind of forgotten for a long, long time. Okay, there was maybe one experiment or one attempt and nothing else. Antin Hirsch proposed it again in the same paper. Uh, in 2000, um, and then uh, this is the idea of essentially you're taking the analogous of anomalous Hall effect and making the analogy into this scattering and the mod scattering uh, from impurities uh, and the symmetries in, in, in a paramagnet as well, and that would tend to generate, it tends to generate a uh, spin current. So here the idea is in a ferromagnet, uh, you have anomalous Hall effect where you have more spins up than spin downs, and you have deflection due to the spin orbit coupling. That is asymmetric, so it's more to the right and to the left. This is what is called mod scattering, and it's actually utilized in, uh, in, 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 in the cyclotron, in the accelerators to polarize electrons actually. Uh, and was the first test, by the way, of the rock physics. That's the, that was the mod scattering, was the, actually the first test of, of relativistic physics. But now, if you apply it to a material that is paramagnetic, uh, because you still have spin over coupling inside this material, you will have still this deflection of more spins up. So to the right, almost three times to the left, and you end up with a spin current flowing in, in this direction. So this is two ideas of extrinsic, which come from this mod scattering, but this idea also, which is the one that is more prevalent now in terms of this stronger effect, uh, coming from the coherence motion of electrons due to the spin orbit coupling. And this is an idea that is important that I want to emphasize now because I'm going to utilize it for the spin orbit torques now as well. Uh, so let me explain a little bit some of the caricature picture of what it is. Uh, so these two essentially are giving you this spin current flowing opposite direction to a current that you apply. In order to see where this intrinsic spin hole effect, uh, you know, I'm using, by the way, a 2D Rashman model, which effectively, in reality, once you put this order, is actually zero. But for the purpose of just illustration, let me just use it. Okay? So ignoring, in, in this case, the scattering. Uh, and the idea is that if you have here, you know, to this Rashman model, the spin orbit coupling, so now your spins are actually lined up perpendicular to your momentum here, okay, in equilibrium. As you run a current, you essentially are accelerating your electrons, and as they accelerate in the <coughs> space, they acquire a slightly a small momentum, and therefore the spin itself will be, instead of having really being aligned with the equilibrium moment, the uh, effective magnetic field that it feels, it will have an extra component now pointing perpendicular to this momentum that is accelerated through. Okay? And that's the one that it will begin to process about. And it, it has to be coherent because it will be two bands to have a, a procession of the spin, in between collisions at least. And here you can notice immediately that, okay, if you now count all the, your, your you know, Fermi, Fermi energy, uh, Fermi surface uh, states, you have these guys are spin down, pointing to the right, and spin up, pointing to the left. So effectively, this is spin current flowing from here to there. Okay. 
there's, not, there's no polarization, there's no net polarization out of the plane in this case, it's just a spin current generated uh, while you're running a current in this direction. This is essentially the basic physics of it. Uh, uh, and then to, from the spin hole effect, of course, from the Amos hole effect is where we got the spin hole effect. And then the inverse spin hole effect, which is injecting a spin current into a, 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 a paramagnet with strong spin orbit coupling, then you're able to measure high voltage. And this is one of the tools that has been used nowadays and is ubiquitous to actually uh, detect the spin currents. Now, but uh, there's been more to this than there's an anomalous hall effect, spin hall effect, and all those things. There's been topological insulators, essentially, there's spin hall effects in steroids. Uh, then you have this mesoscopic behavior. You can do a transistor with it if you like. Uh, but you also are uh, now uh, becoming a player in this MRAM technology. And this is where I want to go next. But before I do so, I need to introduce another effect that comes along at the same time almost as a companion effect to the spin hole effect. And this is the inverse field galvanic effect, or Edelstein effect, sometimes called. Uh, this actually was observed in the 2004 uh, experiment by Wunderle that we were part of, uh, where he observed it, it was a, a pedo uh, galvanic system in two dimensions where you look at the, the LED, the light uh, emitting from each of the sides of the sample, so you have the opposite side, so this is the, the spin hole effect in here. If you run the current, now, in this direction, if you look at now at, the, at what is happening in the plane, uh, when you run the current, you essentially are populating, taking some of these guys and putting them here. And then you can see that in here, you don't have a net spin polarization. But then now in here, in this, in this, uh, once you run a current, you will have a net spin polarization in the plane. So at the same time that you are generating a, a, a spin current, okay, it, a, a polarized perpendicular to the plane, you're also generating a net polarization or non-equilibrium polarization uh, into the, in the plane. And this is something that you can also observe uh, and measure experimentally. And you measure them both at the same time. Okay, so they both exist at the same time in the system. And they both come from this, you know, the origin of, of uh, they're both coming from the spin orbit coupling present in uh, the, 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 the paramagnet. I'm uh, sorry, in the paramagnet. Okay. Now, why is this relevant uh, for moving magnetization and for creating uh, what we call now a spin orbit force? So, because once you actually remember this is the interaction, right? Uh, this physics of the spin hole effect and, uh, and, the, uh, and the Edelstein effect or, the, or this inverse spin galvanic effect remain there even once you put exchange and uh, you couple these carriers to the exchange because the background, the spin orbit coupling is still in the background there, it hasn't gone away. Uh, and this was first observed, this idea, these effective magnetic fields were first observed in Gallimanganese arsenide, which is essentially uh, a diluted magnetic semiconductor. It's, it's a well understood uh, ferromagnet. It's kind of a simple, it's very cacao ferromagnet in a sense, because here you put the manganese, the local moments randomly placed, and they actually interact with, in this case, with the pitot, uh, with the holes of the, of the, the Gallimanganese and there you can tilt the ferromagnet uh, by this uh, the, the magnetic orientation by uh, manipulating these carriers. And in metals, it was observed by looking at the, the nucleation, the difference in perpendicular magnetic systems, uh, looking at the nucleation of domain walls in experience by Mayer and Tal in this first uh, instance. But in this particular experiment, they just observed the fact that yes, in these cases, you have also this inverse field galvanic effect present <coughs> in these systems where there's a spin orbit coupling in the carriers and you have some local moments. But they were not able, to, with these experiments yet, to twist things around, to actually flip, because at the, at the end you need to flip and manipulate fully the, uh, the, uh, the magnetization. So now, you know, the, the experiment that really got people excited was a, a year later, and I was five years old experiment by uh, Miron and uh, uh, Pietro uh, uh, Carvendella's uh, group, uh, where now they run, it, they run a current. This is in a, copper, uh, a cobalt sample with aluminum oxide on the top and platinum on the bottom. And they run the current through the platinum in this case. Okay? And they flipped the ferromagnetism. So essentially, this geometry that I mentioned to you, they said, oh, now it's flipped. Okay? And uh, they try to look at the symmetry of the physics and they try to explain the physics by this Rushby effect, or what they call it Rushby effect, which effectively is the inverse spin galvanic effect coupled to the magnetization. Essentially, if you actually have this physics 
of this non-equilibrium polarization generated on the plane, and you couple this, this delta S, you couple to the magnetization, you create a torque. Okay? Now this torque primarily is a field-like torque, but there's some ways to actually get it to be, in this physics that you see, um, uh, uh, dumping-like by having different lifetimes in the different spin channels. But not enough to actually account for the physics that, that you could see that it was actually dissipative like. Uh, so this is one of the preliminary interpretations that when people thought of rush by spin orbit coupling uh, or spin orbit torques, they really meant that you have this non-equilibrium polarization inducing the carriers that they exchange coupled with the magnetization and they're creating that torque. Okay. Uh, the Cornell experiment, which came immediately after, uh, this is where they actually say in a similar sample where you have now tantalum, and then you're uh, injecting here into this ferromagnet and you're utilizing a ferromagnet on top just to detect in which direction the, this magnetization is now. They were able to detect this essentially doing ferromagnetic resonance um, experiment, effectively. Uh, and they interpreted by saying, look, you know what is happening in here instead is that you're running this uh, current through this heavy metal, um, ma uh, heavy, metal heavy, heavy element metal, tantalum, and you're generating spin current flowing into the ferromagnet. So it's a bit very much like the spin transfer to occur. I don't care if it is a polarized current coming from a, ferromag from a ferromagnet or it's this pure spin current. It's just a flux of angular momentum going in there. Okay. And then it's absorbed, because once it is absorbed, this is naturally, the Zorzeski uh, type of torque is naturally of this form, M cross M cross M, there's two M's in the cross products here, that gives you this anti-dumping-like symmetry. So they interpret that to be to say, look, this is actually intrinsic, but just, so just by looking at the symmetry of the torque that is inducing this, uh, this, uh, this torques, this, this, uh, this, this flips of the magnetization, by looking at the symmetry, which is what experiments can do, primarily observe the symmetry of the torques that they, that they, that they have, uh, we attest that that's, that's the origin of the spin hall effect. Because this one primarily, or they thought that it was only field light. Okay? That is not the case, okay? because in here, and this, so these are the, the, the two physics, what they call rush and spin hall. Here I will not use rush, but I will actually say inverse spin galvanic effect type of torque. Okay? Uh, of course, in a test of what the effect is, itself is. Uh, so these two uh, were competing, or if, you know, but then by, by identifying the symmetry, they were giving origins to one or the other. But here in this tutorial, I want to be clear that this is not the case. The origin of it has not really still been understood in terms of it will change depending on the sample. Some samples will be dominated by this effect, some samples dominated by this effect. And I can show you this why, because essentially each of these you can show that you have both feel like and anti damping in each of them. Okay? Uh, the one in this in the spin hole effect, you have uh, uh, feel like depending on, the, on some of the ratios that you have, this transparency at the interface. But in here, this is the thing that came afterwards. Uh, well, this is, of course, sorry, this is the, just a, a small thing that what you call it now, it, what you, some people call it spin hole torque, spin uh, rush pad torque. By calling it this way, you're assigning an origin to these torques, and it's a dangerous thing, because the only thing here is the symmetry, whether it's energy conserving or not energy conserving, whether this torque depends on the magnetization, whether this field part depends on the magnetic direction or not. So it's much better to call it either anti-damping or Soshensky type torque and a field-like torque, okay, for the name of it. But let me remind you why, uh, particularly this, this part, the one coming from, from the non-equilibrium polarization accumulated due to the inverse galvanic effect actually has the two terms. And this is a bit of a reminder of the physics of the spin hole effect. Yes. Uh, no one asked me question. Yeah. yeah. Uh, how is spin torque typically measured? It, uh, I'll show you in a second. Okay. So uh, because it's actually essentially it's inverting fMR experiments. I'll show you. I'll show you the experiments themselves. It comes. It comes just in a second. In the next slide. Okay. Uh, it's a beautiful way, it's essentially, uh, you'll see it in a, minute, in a minute. And this is why you will understand immediately that the only thing that you can tell is the symmetry okay, of the torques. Okay? But let me, before I go into uh, answering that question, let me tell you about why, when you think about inverse field galvanic effect, you actually have both. Okay? This is the physics, you know, just uh, this is the this is tutorial, this is linear response, condensed matter, Boltzmann theory. Okay? So you have the non-equilibrium distribution function times the equilibrium states. That's what we've been taught in most of the 
of the, um, of the um, talks that we have, of the courses that we've had. And this is the physics that I was talking about, that, okay, you take this electron and put it there, and you have something in the plane. This is the exact same physics of the Akhanov and Hirsch on the spin Hall effect, and this is due to, to, to the scattering of the impurities. <coughs> on the other hand, uh, you know, you have to remember that you also have equilibrium distribution function that's the non-equilibrium states due to the time evolution, this coherent time evolution, polarizability type of effects uh, that you can see here. So just if you put the time evolution and you look at the expectation value times the equilibrium distribution function, you end up with this expectation value, in this case for the spin hole effect, for the spin current generated due spin of coupling. And this should be very familiar to anybody who has worked in this theory point of view to the spin hole effect as intrinsic contribution to the spin hole effect. What happens, of course, is that you're going to have a very similar contribution of this uh, spin accumulation of the same type, of the intrinsic type. So the physics themselves are very, very similar. They're just simply replacing this spin current by spin. Uh, uh, by, by spin. But it is better instead of, to see, instead of seeing the, the, actual, the actual equation, it is better to see by pictures of where it's coming from and why it is dissipated light. Now, remember this picture that I showed you about uh, trying to describe in pictures uh, a little bit uh, physically what intrinsic spin hole effect was about? Well, let's think about what happens now if you have now this spin orbit couple system. So you still have the Rushba spin orbit coupling here, but now it's dominated by this exchange coupling between this magnetization and these carriers. So they're primarily pointing in the direction to, uh, opposite to the magnetization. But when you run a current through that, you still are going to generate. As you, you know, the, the, only, uh, the only change in the effective field is still going to be the one coming from the spin orbit coupling. That's the only one that is changing direction with momentum. And therefore now, but because these guys in equilibrium are pointing in the same direction instead of around a circle like without the magnetization, they all process down. And you see now, instead of, now I'm actually generating by grinding the current, a spin accumulation of the plane. There's no spin current in that case, in that limit, okay? But there is a spin accumulation <coughs> out of the plane, on top of the one that is on the plane. That's still going to remain there. So you have a component out of the plane. And this component, which is the most important part, is the maximum. This component, this non-equilibrium polarization that you're generating, now depends on the relative direction of the magnetization and the current. Okay? The previous one, the one on the plane, you can take my word for it, I've been showing it to you. Uh, but the one on the plane essentially is quite independent of where the magnetization points. It doesn't quite care. There's small oscillations, but relatively none. This one, it does depend a lot, because if I put now the magnetization perpendicular to this, you can notice that as soon as I start running a current, the effective magnetic field increase is along the same direction, so you, you don't have any, any um, uh, torque coming from that. So the dependence of this torque, this m cross delta s, is to this delta s is going to have this cosine of angle, between the magnetization and the current. And it's going to be a field like, uh, sorry, a dissipative like torque. Okay? Because it has this form of uh, M cross M that this component. Okay? Now, uh, let me ask you know, how do you, how do you observe this? How can you tell this in you know, an experiment? Uh, well, the idea now is so remember when you have the double layer systems, when you have a ferromagnet on top, a rush by interaction in the middle and uh, some heavy metal on the bottom, you're going to mix them both. The thing to do is now try to go to a ferromagnet that has inversion symmetry broken. So you have spin orbit coupling there, and of course, if you have a single layer, you don't have a spin hole effect. It's just taken out of the, out of the picture. You're just looking at the physics of this inverse, uh, inverse spin harmonic effect and see if you actually start torques. These are the physics that we can do in Kalemang and Sarsenite because there we have a linear component that depends on the strain, where you have, uh, you have this type of strain, the shear strain or compressive strain. And here you have two components. You have the rush bar itself has no dependence of the angle on, the, on the, where your current is flowing. In this case, it's just cosine of the angle that is flowing. You know, it's asymmetric along the, uh, in the circle. But the nice thing with the Dressel house, which happens, is strong in, in Kalemastanite, is that it has a crystal independence, meaning that if I run the current in this direction, this, this non equilibrium polarization, the angular dependence of this one, you just can look at this, it is cosine, so there's a shift of minus 90 degrees, so that will be sine. Along this direction, if I run it along this direction, it will be cosine, <coughs> etc. Okay? So you can make a table of what you expect, depending on which of the, the spin of the coupling dominates 
in the systems of the strain. And this is something that we understand in the, in the systems and we control pretty well the parameters by now. And once you run the experiment, and this is how you actually observe them, you're effectively doing an inverse fMR experiment to actually observe it. In fMR for magnetic resonance, you put a small magnetic field perpendicular to your magnetization and you oscillate it at the resonance frequency and see a peak. But in this case, what you want to do is to run a current, essentially a, a, a microwave current, through your sample. And, and this is going to be this internal field that you're generating is going to be the field that you're actually are, um, are, uh, are, are, are using to excite it. And by looking at the angular dependence of this amplitude and the composite between, uh, between symmetric and anti-symmetric component of this resonance, you can tell the component of this field. So it's just taking the energy equation, doing some algebra, and inverting it. Just looking at the angular dependence. So this is how it's actually measured in this fMR type of experiments. There's other techniques that you can do, but in this case, this is, this is uh, one of them that we use. And this is where, in here, by looking, you know, if you to look at this, this resonance, where you essentially just, you, you, you rest, you're measuring a rectified uh, <coughs> voltage, a DC voltage in this case, uh, it will give you a natural dependence of this angle of the current and the magnetization, and uh, the symmetric component, which is essentially the one that is the anti-damping torque, and the asymmetric component is the one that is giving you the one perpendicular to it, that is the field like or rush bar torque, has this natural angular dependence. This sine of 2 theta comes from the energy equations, okay? And this other angle, sine of theta and sine of cosine, those comes from the energy equations as well. And then the idea is to extract what is the angular dependence or angular dependence of x, y, and z components of these effective fields that you're generating by the current. Uh, in experiments of gallium-manganese this is, of course, what, uh, what was observed in the different directions and what we uh, fitted by the theory. So essentially, this is the thing that showed that you could have both. This was in gallium-manganese. This was in a case of, uh, of uh, this, 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 this experiment, so essentially taking this experience in gallium-manganese and running a current. You have components in the plane. Uh, the, 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 the slide that I showed you next, this one over here, is what I showed you here. Uh, and this is very highly non-trivial. You have some uh, particular, um, you know, in this case, not a sine or a cosine. Okay, it's because here you are, it's not so simple. You actually have this Q square spin-orbit coupling structure with a linear component. So if you have just a linear, it will just give you sine and cosine. But because of this, it's a higher, higher, um, higher um, orders uh, in the contributions. But it's still, uh, the two, the, this, this actually will. One of the first times that I actually did the calculation without looking at the experiment and the same experiment, I just put it on top of each other and I said I would touch it. <laughs> so it's very good. Uh, so now, is it, sorry, is it complementary or is it... Uh, uh, no, in this case it's just you're running, you're running, it's an fMR experiment. You're running, literally you're measuring a voltage here and you're measuring the resonance of this voltage, this rectified voltage. <laughs> you're just measuring a rectified voltage, this is exactly how the experiment looks like. You are running this current and measuring this easy rectified voltage because effectively you are using AMR and this rectified voltage to actually see this resonance. So you're looking, you're doing exactly <coughs> what. What are the time scales? How quickly can you build up the torque? And how quickly can you measure it? Well, these these are measures done in in, uh, in uh, microwaves, microwave times, so microseconds, things like that. Okay, but these are the natural scales uh, of of the ferromagnets. It's not faster than that. From the point of view of the build up, of course, of the electrons, the electronic system, the scale is much, much, much faster. Mm -hmm. The one that is slowing here is the magnetization, just micro, you know, has a, a microwave a megahertz type of uh, frequencies associated with the precession of the ferromagnet. Mm -hmm. Once we go to the next one, which is uh, uh, anti ferromagnets, you know, then you talk in terrors and all this all stuff. Very exciting. Okay. Um, Okay, so so these ideas, you know, this is just uh, to wrap up a little bit of this idea of spin orbit works. Uh, now you can go, of course, we did this, this in gallium magnetic arsenide, which nobody's going to use because this is a, uh, a little magnetic fer uh, ferromagnet <coughs> whose transition temperature is only about, you know, maximum is about 190 Kelvin. So it's not going to be useful for any technology whatsoever. So you want to go to ferromagnets uh, to actually observe this type of physics. And here, you, of course, you have to go to ferromagnets. It is non-trivial to find ferromagnets with broken inversion symmetry. Because, you know, otherwise, you would not end up with the spin-orbit coupling effects in those systems. 
of the ones that I've told you about. Uh, and uh, this is where you can go to the Hoysers, for example, which has a very similar structure as Gallimastenite, in this case, nickel manganese and Timonite, and try to do the same calculations of this non equilibrium polarization that you can generate by the inverse Spilgavanic effect. Uh, and one of your experiments, in this case, is dominated by the phi like components, uh, but these are the experiments and the fits from the theory uh, that you can see in, in a recent uh, paper uh, as it's already. Okay. So, uh, also, the, besides the, the, the measuring technique that I mentioned to you uh, of this fMR, there's other ones, this is magnetization switching that was originally done by uh, uh, Miron. There's also the AC uh, voltage part, which is that you are looking at a second harmonic that you can measure as well. Uh, you have the spin torque by fMR, which is the one that I just told you about, which is essentially looking at a rectified uh, signal. Uh, and then there's also, of course, the MOOC, where you essentially you're trying to observe directly the ferromagnetic domains by looking at, uh, essentially, the Faraday effect uh, and looking at the perpendicular magnetization of the system and see whether it moves or not. Okay. So these are different techniques, of course, to look at the storks. Uh, some of the better ones, I think, is this one in terms of really understanding the symmetry of, of, the, of, the, of the course. Okay. So now, now, so this is a little bit of, of where you know, spin of torch has told us, so essentially just to recap a little bit, which I'm going a little fast through this. Uh, you know, you started from this idea of spin transfer torque, which is a very well established physics, I think now by now, uh, characterized by these uh, concepts of uh, spin missing contactances. And then uh, began to think of different ways of doing flipping uh, magnetization by utilizing concepts of a spin hole effect and the companion effect, the inverse spin galvanic effect. Both of them are really related, they're coming from similar physics. One of them is giving you a spin current, the other one is giving you a spin accumulation. There's, two, there's a difference between those two. Uh, and these ones are then utilized now to create a spin orbit torques. And we call them a spin orbit torques, of course, uh, because the origin is uh, arising from a spin orbit coupling. When you have to have a spin hole effect and a spin transfer torque coupled together, they're still calling it a spin orbit torque. I myself wouldn't call it that way. We just call it spin transfer torque, uh, with the spin hole effect providing the spin current. Uh, but I want you to emphasize as well that spin over torque in the sense of the inverse spin effect is a transfer angular momentum, it's a transfer of angular momentum arising internally. It's a bit like a cat flipping itself, if you think about it. Okay? But in this case you have a subsystem, which is the lattice, where you're extracting some angular momentum from the lattice. It's a little weird if you think about it, because most of the time you think of the lattice of something that just takes away and defaces your spin. But in this case, due to the spin orbit coupling generated by the arrangements <laughs> of the atoms, uh, and running current through the systems, you're able to extract a finite angular momentum from the lattice in this sense. And using that to flip your ferromagnet. Uh, which is, you know, I like it to say like, you know, it's a you know, magnetic cut. You know, you know what I mean by cut, right? You put it back and you shouldn't do that, but you know, if you do it, don't cut the tail, it would be bad. Okay, so. Uh, so going to the uh, now to now the next step uh, that I wanted to mention in the last uh, few minutes uh, is the idea of antiferromagnets. Okay. Uh, so so we've we've learned about spin orbit torques of how you actually do it in ferromagnets. So you generate this non equilibrium polarization and this this magnetization start flipping around it. So let's try to do this now in an antiferromagnet. Can we do this? And the idea is yes, uh, we can actually do this. Um, and you can actually do this, uh, and it's very non-trivial in this case, in a centrosymmetric system. And if I say centrosymmetric system and a spin orbit coupling, you think, ah, that's zero. Unfortunately, it's, uh, yeah, you would have thought that, that's why we have thought a couple of years ago. But that's not the case. Uh, because you have to be reminded that spin orbit coupling is a very local thing. It's essentially a thing of the atoms themselves. It comes from the core electrons themselves. Okay. And if you now have a system where you have two inversion partners, two uh, broken inversion symmetry partners, lattice, so in this case I'm showing you the manganese -mang -mang to gold, copper manganese arsenide is also similar. And here, this is centrosymmetric, but if you look at the two sub lattices, this blue and red, or purple and red, they actually have, they're actually uh, inversion symmetric pairs. Look at where the gold is in here and the gold atom is in that. Okay? What I mean by that, if you actually think about it, if you run a current through the system, okay, at the atomistic level, meaning within the unit cell, you may expect, and you do get it, a feed-like 
Rashba-like uh, spin accumulation, Edelstein effect type, in each sublattice being opposite to each other. And this I mean that now this guy effectively, atomistically, you can actually show an equilibrium that it has a spin texture, what's called hidden spin texture. I think uh, uh, Zunger has also seen this in, in some calculations. Where you look at this hidden spin texture within this within the unit itself, that goes in this direction and that direction, the opposite paralities, okay, because it has opposite uh, inversion partners. That means that when you run a current in the opposite sub lattices, uh, you will have opposite spin accumulations. Now, any experiment will never be able to see, or any external probe will never be able to see anything that changes in the unit cell that rapidly. Okay, that's not possible. Right. Any, any, any transport thing will actually average it all out completely. That's why it's hidden. It's nothing that you've ever seen. Except for the fact that nature is naturally the perfect probe to see it. Okay? Which is the name of the parameter itself. So in this case, the idea is that you can run a current in these particular systems. Okay? And the name of the parameter will orient itself perpendicularly. Uh, when you do the calculations, so you have to do a, a real calculation, so the prediction was in, you know, in the fall of 2014, and you actually do the, the, the linear response calculations, so these are calculations we know how to do, and you end up with, yes, uh, effectively what I just have told you, that in each sub lattice you have opposite sides, and here is a field, you know, it's, it's very much like the Edelstein effect. If you run a current in the x direction, okay, in this plane, so it's a z plane in this plane, uh, you will end up with a spin accumulation effective magnetic field, uh, in the uh, perpendicular in the y direction. Okay, very much like the Edelstein effect in the Rashba system, in the Rashba system, the Cattle system. And it, uh, what I'm showing here is the angular dependence. It, you know, as I mentioned to you, it doesn't really, oh yeah, it's some, some angular dependence, but very little. Okay? It's primarily just constant, okay? perpendicular to that, and zero along the direction of the current. Okay, okay so what, uh, what if, you know, let me show a picture, picture of what it really means. I mean, the equations is fine and dandy on the theories, we have to do the calculations, but it's much better to have a picture in your head. And uh, this is a picture done by Frank Freiberg. Uh, this, by the way, was actually done by some Python script. It was not done by this fancy, you know, it was very, <laughs> you know, he actually coded these, uh, these wires here uh, in some sort of uh, Python script. And uh, you can think of this as kind of wrapping different solenoids in different orientations in the different sub lattices. Literally, that's what you're doing. More or less, okay. Of course, you know this is the you know, virtual quantum world, but effectively uh, you run in the current and then you reorient you for your ferromagnet. So if you start it this way and you run your current, you will just reorient the ferromagnet. Yeah, the ferromagnet. Okay. Now, how can you see this or, or, or observe it? Sorry, back back to this. Uh, sorry, there's actually two types. Sorry, I was talking about this. Uh, this is the, the uh, when for the normal ferromagnet where you have the two sub the two spin polarizations in the same sub lattice. This is the one that I told you about. We have opposite polarizations in opposite sub lattice. That's where I switched the, the notation in this in this uh, in this table. Uh, you also would have another one of this form of the anti-damping one I haven't told you about, and uh, but that will be for maybe tomorrow. Yeah. But these nail spin orbit couples, uh, these nail spin orbit torques. Uh, are useful, and for example, one prediction we haven't verified that yet is the fact that you can utilize it to really, really have this staggering uh, uh, antiferromagnetic domain ball velocities due to staggering fields. And here, the word staggering means like giant. Okay? <coughs> because in this case, you can actually move the main walls at 50 kilometers per second uh, from, uh, from this type of torque. It's essentially the counter force. Uh, that was shown uh, by, uh, by Helen uh, and I uh, in our group uh, uh, that we'll maybe tell you about later on to, uh, in the week. Okay. Uh, but the, the key thing is that uh, we want to also see, okay, is there a possibility to also have these anti-dumping ones? And these ones is, uh, by this I mean that if you have now a Russian spin orbit coupling, in the previous picture I had that the spin orbit coupling was essentially had the opposite chirality in the opposite sub lattices because you have two uh, pairs of, of opposite uh, inversion partners uh, coupled together. You can have a system where you have a homogeneous spin orbit coupling, like an interface here with ferromagnet and a, and a heavy metal, anti-ferromagnet and a heavy metal, 
we have a homogeneous Rashba field filled by both sub lattices. So this field light will be zero because each of them cancel each other out. But the anti dumping one will be non zero. So you end up with an effective field that you actually can't see that is quite strong dependent on the angular dependence. This is a key thing to notice whether it's field light or anti dumping light. Okay? Uh, and it's the key to notice whether it's, it's this form or that form. A, a word of caution um, on antiferromagnets, I don't think it's, a, it's needed a word of caution here, this is an expert uh, in, in antiferromagnetism <coughs> and the equations of motion antiferromagnetism. Unlike ferromagnetics, okay, once you have an antiferromagnet, the equations of motion is, is a Newtonian one. It has mass. So the flipping of this thing is not that trivial. So, you know, before an anti-dumping one is utilized, you just flip it and then you just go to another local minimum uh, due to this dynamic instability that you generate. How these torques can actually generate some switches is more difficult, okay, than the one in the ferromagnets. But the one that, uh, that is also going to be one of the messages as well is that it's going to be much stronger because in a ferromagnet, you have this, uh, this is where the theory, that you have to go back to the equation that I showed you, so you have one over the difference of the energy bands that you're coupled to, the square, in the denominator. In a ferromagnet, you always have a difference between, you know, this is the exchange splitting, always there. In the antiferromagnet, the splitting itself of how you're coupling is due just to the spin orbit coupling, because the splitting comes in the middle of the band, and you can have your thermal energy here. So you end up with torques that can be gigantic compared to the ones in ferromagnet. So those are the physics of, of some of the torques that, we've, uh, that, uh, that you can actually uh, predict. Okay? The nice thing with this is that we predicted it is effectively this, uh, now, now, to, now exactly almost a years ago, and uh, it was last February when it was observed. Okay? The field light one. Okay? Not the, not the antinomic one, but the field light one in copper manganese acid and this beautiful paper uh, by the pro group of Thomas Jangworth and Nottingham group. Uh, working together in this material, copper manganese arsenide, uh, in the science paper that, that appeared uh, just in February, uh, where they're able to flip it, and you can able to see it because you're essentially utilizing AMR to detect the, the switching. And anything that, you know, in antiferromagnets, anything that is linear magnetization is difficult to see. Anything that is M square, which is AMR, uh, is not that hard to see. Uh, so this is where they were able to, to do these switches and flips. Not only that, they were able to create from this an actual device of uh, about you know, a few bit memory, okay, of, uh, of uh, that can couple to a, uh, to a in this case laptop and see the switches back and forth. So this is the first memory you're seeing there, the first all electric antiferromagnetic memory of your life. And I want you to remember this moment, okay, because in a few decades or maybe in a decade. All your laptops could have just antiferromagnetic memories in it. These are very good things to have because they're all electrical, they're all scaling, okay, but they're totally radiation intensive. You can go to any lab with large magnetic field, nothing happens to it, very stable, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and the materials are there to do it. Okay, and it's very fast. Okay? In this case, it's a small, but it's actually, you know, for me, it's fascinating to have seen. It's the first time that I see that rapid uh, switch between production, observation, and then an actual device that you can plug in a computer. Of course, you know, you're not going to save uh, your clocks on this, okay? It's like you know, 5 bytes or 10 bytes or something like that. Um, but, uh, but still, you know, it has a lot of potential to connect. And uh, just a little point out, in this case, we're talking terahertz dynamics that you can eventually connect to optics as well. This is why a lot of excitement is coming from uh, these physics. So now, uh, I will just I'll take five more minutes. I think, <coughs> I, have, uh, five minutes maybe? I, think I started at 10.30 uh, or 11.30. Yeah, yeah. 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 People are hungry and you need to use 10 minutes as well. Uh, this is a bit of a highlight. I'll talk about it more tomorrow and the talk tomorrow. Unfortunately, I have to leave immediately after uh, to catch a plane in Tokyo. Uh, but this is actually where now, this is the idea of merging ideas. So we've gone to merging to uh, fermac, you know, ferromagnetic system, well-established ferromagnetic concepts, to spin orbitronics, another calling it spin orbitronic concepts of the spin hall effect, uh, merging those two areas to create spin orbit torques. And then now merging this area or jumping it uh, to the nail and antiferromagnetic systems. Now we want to think about antiferromagnetics and topological physics. 
okay. And it's a very natural conception, actually. It's actually quite okay. Uh, these things started, the idea of spin electronics and uh, topological physics has started almost a similar uh, around 2004 from graphene and spin Hall effect. And they've gone in a very rapid path with a lot of development, a lot of very rapid developments, uh, kind of independent sometimes of each other. Uh, but there is a possibility uh, of naturally having uh, this Dirac of uh, metals or Dirac uh, across the particles or bile uh, across the particles as well in antiferromagnets. Because here, what you really need is the PT symmetry, so the parity and time reversal symmetry, the product being conserved, which is a natural thing that you can do in antiferromagnets. Okay. Um, and by having so, essentially, you end up with the physics of the two. Uh, coupled together, and of course the PT symmetry, the things that, that you require in order to have these crossings, these direct crossings, it turns out serendipitously, <laughs> is the same symmetries that you require to have this type of nail spinorum torques, particularly in copper magnetic arsenal. Okay, it's in the sample that we show. Uh, so we're just finishing something, we we'll hopefully will be, uh, we'll submit it this week. Uh, where essentially we can show that it, it, this is uh, calculations on copper manganese arsenide where the experiment was done and we also have a simple minimal model that you can show how this thing is broken where now you have you have the crossings established but unlike you know similar to graphene but in graphene once you put a spin of a coupling nothing protects your ga your, your crossings essentially you gap them out okay so many times they are gapped out so you need some extra symmetry to protect you and in this case, in the case of uh, copper manganese arsenide, that is, there's non-symorphic symmetries, which are a point rotation and a translation, okay, the unit L. Uh, and these exist uh, in these antiferromagnets and uh, depends on the orientation of the nail spin order, of the nail order parameter. So depending on which direction the nail order parameter points, or your magnetization points, uh, you will have these crossings protected. But we have just shown in these systems, that you can control the nail or the parameter, the direction by a current. So in this case, you're able to switch to open or close the gap, a Dirac gap, this is a Dirac because uh, a particle or not, going from metal to, to from a semiconductor or, or some effect on the transport, depending on, on where your gaps, of course, reside, whether they reside here or they reside close to the Fermi surface, um, uh, turn it on and off by a current. Okay. This is, you know, conserving those two physics in here. So this is something that, that hopefully will be an exciting new direction of the field uh, where you can begin to look at the political physics coupled with this idea of manipulation of the nail parameter by nail spin or torques. Okay? And hopefully I'll tell you a little bit about more about that tomorrow, but effectively it's just saying that, you know, if I just move around in this phase space where this is the nail order parameter of where it points, you can end up with different phases between the direct metal semiconductor uh, and the same with the other, you know, with these guys flipped around. Okay. Uh, so, so this uh, brings me to the end. Okay. Uh, just to summarize uh, what I told you about uh, this tutorial, by the way, is a similar that I gave a week ago uh, in the Ferromagnetics workshop, so you can see it online uh, if you want to go to the Spice website. Uh, I told you a little bit about spin transfer program at the beginning, this well established physics that now I really I really want to give you actual devices of, uh, that you can put in some systems uh, and how we utilize the physics of the spin hole effect and the inverse spin hole effect, the two that come together uh, to give you a spin orbit torques, both in the ferromagnet that are field and anti dumping like uh, that may be of importance, particularly for fast switching in these new new MRAP memories. And then how from this we've learned how to manipulate now nail as order parameters directly by electric fields uh, and, and observe them and actually create an actual device for it. And then the next step, I believe, could be of interest uh, where you actually are merging this physics of uh, electron control of direct fermions uh, through uh, this spin of talk physics. So thank you very much for your time. Yeah. yeah, it's supposed to be by the students, you know? I do, yeah. No, you don't. <laughs> <laughs> you, you, you. <laughs> right, yeah. You have been talking mostly about uh, spin magnetization, right? So if you have a three dimensional ferromagnet with uh, the appropriate point, the parallel point, 
Oh, and I don't see much of that. Okay. So, are those ever important? Will they just be added to your equations? Or? Uh, no, they're not added to the, to the equation. It's this idea of orbital magnetization playing some roles this is actually in Europe. Microsoft has been computing those things, and we talked about it last, last week in the, in the workshop, but they are not really coupled to the magnetization directly. You don't have an SD change there. Uh, in, sense, in terms of the dynamics that you can induce, they're not so relevant. There are going to be contributions in some systems due to orbital contributions of magnetization, but they don't seem to be relevant for dynamics of magnetization at this point. That, that was at least what he said. I, I, this is something I haven't worked on, so I'm just passing that message from Yuri Euro, Euro, Microsoft. So it's also another Ukrainian, okay? And he works in Ulick doing the initial calculations. And you can also see his talk in the Spice website. There's a question here. Yeah. Okay, so a last question from a new point of a, of a student. <laughs> I know them all, you know? So I'm looking at the first part of the talk, and I see uh, basically that if I want to calculate torque in the standard uh, magnetic tunnel junction spin locks, I have to use, for example, spin mixing conductance, some scattering theory, uh, some Kekish formalism, and fundamentally uh, that torque, spin transfer torque, as any other torque, is some kind of place of spin torque operator times an equilibrium density matrix, which is that equation at the beginning, which is M plus M. You can, you can look at the torques directly, as you have done also in Euro as well, or you can sometimes, if you assume that they are decoupled by a constant uh, exchange, then you can look at the spin accumulation directly. Yeah, so, it, so at the end of the day, it, the torque can always be written down. And actually, that's the most universal way, because in the presence of spin orbit coupling, some other methods will break down as a non-equilibrium spin density cross magnetization. And so, yeah, and see, if I, if I calculate, this is the first part of the talk, if I calculate torque in that way uh, in uh, this uh, magnetic tunnel junction of carrying energy ion, in my formalism, I would always see that all the formulas are written down in such a way that there is no electric field and all the quantities are at the Fermi surface, or in the shell of the Fermi surface. In, so, in, 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 you mean in the scattering formalism or which formalism? Yeah, the scattering formalism. Okay. Like, uh, yeah, it has a paper scattering theory of talking about the yeah, But that's not true. I mean, you, you do have contributions from the interbands hidden. I mean, they're, they're, it is a little bit of misconception on this. Go ahead. You so, I, 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 talk, I, I had a question, but I had a comment. So, this, this, is, this is the question, actually. So, now I switch to the spin orbit torque and I use Kubo formula in, in response, and suddenly there is this. Same thing, which is non equilibrium M cross M, yeah. but now the formula for non equilibrium M contains all this uh, interbank uh, contribution. Yes, the yeah. electric field and all this stuff. So that's the student. The answer is that they're both. How are these two things connected? In other words, this is a little bit tricky, but, yeah. Yeah, but uh, there is an answer to it. So um, let me finish. So the student could ask a question like, will I take your Kubo formula from the second part of the talk and apply it to standard iron MGO iron? And this is something that I don't see when I use the scattering uh, for okay. example. Okay. And so the second question is actually a little bit more technical, which is that in many recent experiments on spin orbit torque uh, using mock or micromagnetic simulations, they actually see a highly inhomogeneous switching pattern, which means that the torque itself, anti dumping one, which is co causing the magnetization to switch up to, up to down, is not that inhomogeneous across the whole sample. Okay but it only switches the edges. And so the torque starts at the edges, so that means that as if there is a really a non-zero anti-dumping torque only at the edge of the sample, and then these two domain walls propagate, and that's where they also get to apply magnetic field. So the question is like, again, uh, when you use this uh, Kubo formula with all these electric fields, it looks like as if your torque is homogeneous across the whole thing. So how would you find the torque is non-zero only at the edges of the sample? All right, so we have two, two distinct parts here. Uh, so, so uh, Branislav was asking the question, okay, I have this uh, scattering theory on equilibrium these functions, essentially, and the usual bulk Kubo formula, okay? And if you look at the non-equilibrium Greaves function theory, when you do the trace of these things in the linear response, you do the trace at the Fermi energy, okay? And some of the physics that I was telling you about this interband coherence, when you do the Kubo formula itself, you're writing things that are having these virtual transitions 
that are actually you're summing or you're having an integration over the Fermi C in a sense. Okay, that looks like it's a Fermi C. Which one is right? They're both right because it's a linear response. The beginning of it, the steps, they're both equally the same. In one case, you have this non equilibrium of uh, part of a, the non equilibrium which function or component is G lesser, and that contains off diagonal components. Okay? But these off diagonal components, you can extract it out and write it effectively the same way. If you should end up in the bulk large system, you would have to meet the two, the two meet each other. Sometimes it's better, for example, if you have interfaces and such things like that, the, the, uh, the scattering formalism will be usually stronger. But if you're looking at bulk effects, uh, the Kubo formalism can be simpler. Okay? The two at the end of the day have to agree in this case. I mean, that's actually a test that we've actually done both ways, calculating the one side calculation that I showed you about spin over torque, by the way, we've done both for Kubo and scattering theory, but the scattering one, we're actually looking at intensive components when you look at the the size of the, of the sample. Okay, so both are the same thing in linear response. The advantage, of course, of non-equilibrium response is that you can go to non-linear responses. This is useful as well. Uh, so in terms of that, 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 that was actually something that had been worked out at least you know still is some, some possible sometimes in terms of how you create the codes. Uh, you are an expert on the non-equilibrium response part um, to do it, but the two are equivalent. In the, in the sense where you were talking about afterwards, like, okay, in the Kubo, you look at a bulk homogeneous effect. Okay? How do you take care of the fact that sometimes you can have some anisotropies due to the edges, due to some, you know, you were talking about micromagnetic simulations. Micromagnetic simulations are not experiments, they're numerical experiments. I'm talking about MOC. MOC sees the. Yeah, so MOC sees this, but essentially the MOC sees. Uh, there's a lot of inhomogeneities in there, and they actually you also have the Lozinski Maria, for example, and then you end up having the edges being important. So a lot of these things are, you know, that's when you talk about a lot of modeling uh, of something more specific, that, that something that you, it is telling you that is actually inhomogeneous, that, that your alpha parameter changes within, uh, within, the, uh, within the, the size of the domain, for example. Uh, that is still being discussed a little bit. There's this idea of chiral dumping and things like that, but uh, that's, that's at the moment not very clear. That's mm -hmm. yeah. well, it's just very simple. Uh, I asked, how did you, when you introduce the anti ferromagnetic uh, uh, part of the talk, I, I didn't understand how you did detect the spin flip. Uh, how, how did you know which direction the uh, the uh, nail? Uh, AMR. Essentially, you're doing XMLD, which is. Right, what AMR and then you get some kind of splitting in the line. No, 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 no. We didn't do for the for the for the for the antiferromagnetic experiments. It was a DC component experiment. You run the current, and you see the XMLD. The what is XMLD? Sorry, I'm XMLD sorry. is AMR in, in AC. <laughs> sorry, in, uh, XMLD is. Uh, uh, X-ray uh, magnetic, uh, magnetic linear dichroism, okay? And this is essentially, you should think of it as AMR with uh, that uh, element-specific AMR, that you can actually do by, by detecting uh, like the shine X-rays on the sample, okay? I'm sorry, I don't understand this. So, oh, uh, okay, all right. In, in, um, in XMLD, you go to the cyclotron, you find X-rays on the sample, and they can excite core electrons, okay, this particular specific element core electrons, and there you actually look at the, what's called the linear dichroism, which effectively is AMR, and that's the tropic magnetic resistance. Okay. You can yeah, like, that's just, the tropic magnetic resistance. Yes, so AMR, that's what I mean by resonance. AMR, yeah. It, it was not a resonance, it, you know. Okay, so AMR to be meant uh, resonance. You're oh, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. Yeah. Yeah. FMI is resonance. I'm so sorry. Yes, yes. Translation. So yes, yes. So, uh, yeah. So, yeah, this is a okay. thing. So, now uh, it's anisotropic magnetoresistance. Okay. And and why? How do you, there are two sublattices, and how do you know which sublattice is which? They're the same elements in the two sublattices. Uh, no, in this case, uh, you actually see the different. Uh, uh, I'll have to show. Uh, I don't have the slides in here. Oh. Uh, right now. Because, yeah, okay. Where is this guy? Oh, that's the wrong square. Essentially, uh, okay, I don't have this. I have to 
show it to you later. Uh, so essentially, if you look directly at the, at the signal, okay, What's it? the signal of the XMLD, okay, if you run the current like this in the middle, this side will go dark, this side will go white. And uh, this is a contrast because they are, they, are, they are different depending on the orientation of the L order parameter, whether it's this direction or that direction. So you can tell the difference between, you can't tell between uh, X and minus X. Of course not. X yeah. and y. This is a ferromagnet, anti-ferromagnet. This, 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 that that's exactly. That's why I was asking the yeah. question in the first place. Okay, yeah. And you were talking, about, I thought you were talking about flipping from, from X to minus X. You were talking about flipping from X to... Yeah, I mean, an antiferromagnet you can only tell 90 degrees. You cannot tell 180 degrees. Right, okay. Yeah, sorry about that. Yeah, I went too fast. Yeah. A bit of a failure there. More questions? Yes. Can you, text you? <laughs> can you please clarify a little bit? Uh, in the very beginning, you've shown us. Uh, the current of uh, the particles in the same state. How do you experimentally get them? Uh, like the very, uh, in the very beginning, like the first slide with the movie. Okay. Uh, from your side, it goes in the other direction. Uh, so uh, the particles were entering the ferromagnet. Yeah. That's great. Uh, maybe previous one. They are just in the same state. How do you obtain them in the same state? Well, here you are running. You you have a metal going into the ferromagnet, and here all I do the pictures of the majority uh, electrons lined up. This is a ferromagnet that have these carriers lined up with the magnetization. Okay, and then when they come out, this is a non-ferromagnetic metal, so they still maintain the polarization. Okay, as long as this uh, this length is not is, is, is smaller than the diffusion length. I think the question is, <coughs> do you assume hundred percent polarization? No, of course not. This is just to make an illustration. In reality, you actually have some up and some down. It's, it's a small percentage that it's actually polarized. But before the ferromagnet, uh, are they in the same state? Yeah, because they can they can come and connect them through I don't know copper to the ferromagnet. Some current that is unpolarized goes into the first ferromagnet that is pretty thick, and in this ferromagnet they equilibrate, so they essentially have the polarization of the ferromagnet. Mm -hmm. Okay, it's can be 50 percent, 50 percent, depending on the ferromagnet. Here, only did the illustration with a perfect ferromagnet, which doesn't exist, but you know, just to make the illustration, and then it goes into the other ferromagnet, not aligned with it, and then <laughs> it, uh, it acquires the angular momentum that is not aligned. More questions? So